Todd Michael Hall, welcome to 69 Face of Rock. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Mark. Thank you for having me. First of all, congratulations on your new solo album, Off the Rails. Oh, thank you. Got to be a relief to finally get this out. Um, how did this project get started? Well, you know, I had done, uh, you know, an album in 2001. I released an album where uh, I'd worked with Kurt Vanderhoof from Metal Church. Um, and he wrote the music and I wrote all the lyrics and vocal melodies and we had a good time doing that. So we thought it'd be fun. And uh, this one was, it just took a little longer to get it done. You know, he had written some stuff for me and it took me you know, a few months to get stuff written. And then you know, he got busy with some metal church stuff. And then he got, you know, we did some arrangement stuff and then he sent it to me and then we got it done. And then the record label and release. And so it's, it's amazing how long it takes, you know, uh, certainly well over two years to get it all done. So. I don't know how bands ever got, you know, one album done every year. You know, it just seems like so much effort. But I guess if you're putting full-time effort into it, that would be easier, yeah. So it must be a great relief. Uh, you just mentioned your big partner in this venture is Kurt Vanderhoof uh, of Metal Church. How would you describe your musical relationship? Well, um, originally, you know, what happened is, uh, I mean, I had met Kurt like way back I think it's around 2016 or so, um, because we had opened up for Metal Church at the, I think it's the Z7 or something in Switzerland. And um, and so I'd met him and, you know, we talked a little bit, but uh, we didn't really stay in touch. And then um, after that, um, I, after I was on The Voice in 2020, um, you know, the, the, you know, kind of while I was still on The Voice, I reached out to Joe uh, O'Brien from Rat Pack Records. And told them that I thought, I mean, I, I really like to put out like a, 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 an album in the classic rock style, you know, I'd done like eight heavy metal albums in a row, I was ready to try something else. And uh, I asked him if he knew of anybody that could, you know, maybe help me, con you know, turn some of my originals into hard rock songs. And he's like, I think I got the guy. And then he came back and said, all right, talk to him. He's up for it. He wants to do it. And, that, and he and, you know, hooked me up with Kurt. And I was like, oh, wow. And so, you know, we... Uh, we basically met over Zoom. This was actually during pandemic and everything. This was way back in 2020. Um, just felt like we had a lot in common, a lot of things that we, um, you know, both, you know, liked as far as the music. And um, actually, like, I showed him a bunch of demos that I already had. And he said, well, you know, rather than do that, how about, you know, I'll just, you know, get inspired and, and write some stuff. And, and then you can write lyrics and vocal melodies for it. And we'll just create a bunch of new stuff. And he is, and so that's what we did. And, he, and he's an amazing. Uh, he's an incredible songwriter. And I think he, uh, for that original album, he produced, he, he wrote 18 songs in like 21 days. It was amazing. You know, I, I just, I don't even know how he did it. And he, so he sends me a demo and then I listen to it and, and uh, write lyrics and vocal melodies for it. And um, then we kind of go back and forth on the songs a little bit, just arrangements and stuff. And, and so that's pretty much how we, how we worked for the second one too, you know. Um, but, you know, obviously this time we've met in person a, a few times, you know, filming videos together and stuff like that. So. Got it. Um, I'm very impressed by your vocal melodies. How do you come up with them? Is there a special process that you follow? Um, you know, not really. I usually say that, you know, songs sing to me, you know. So like when Kurt gives me a demo, I, we were actually he was just with me over the weekend because we played a show a Friday night and uh, we worked on some songs while he was here. and. And it's amazing, you know, when he gives me a demo, we were remarking on how great his demos sound, you know, like he just makes what's a demo, but, you know, because of the way he records at home and has his own studio, he can just make everything sound so good. And for me, um, you know, obviously, you don't have to have a really good demo for the song to sing to you, but obviously that helps. Um, and I think for me, you know, I've definitely had songs where someone would hand me a song and then I would try to think of something and like I would get a little stumped. Um, sometimes it can happen because musicians, you know, they're not used to writing for singers. They're more instrumentalists. And so they write what I would call busy music. It's got like way too much stuff going on. And so there's not really, you know, sometimes you need to create space for a vocalist to come on. So what you really want is a, is a bed of, of, you know, chords and progressions that, that, uh, elicit, uh, you know, great melodic ideas over top of them. And, uh, and Kurt's certainly really good at providing that, that type of music, you know, for me. So, yeah, where do the melodies come from? I mean, you know, I've, I've heard so many songs over the years that I, I, I dare say, you know, there's probably moments when you're almost copying somebody or, you know what I mean? It's because how do you know? It's all uh, 
uh, subconscious, you know, and, and in your in your subconscious mind somewhere, I'm sure you're influenced by something. But um, the one thing that I do think is interesting is how, you know, you can hand the same song to like two, three different people and then they all come back with, you know, like different stuff. Because like a lot of times when I write it, I'll be like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that's what it is. And, and meanwhile, somebody else will come up with something else. I mean, I had that experience with Riot, you know, a couple of times. You know, on, on our last album where um, I wrote, you know, some melodies for stuff and then Donnie wrote some melodies and then his melodies ended up winning over, even though I, I thought mine were better. But, you know, he wrote the song, so he gets the pick, I guess. Uh, you know, so so sometimes it works like that. I, a collaboration can be really nice. That's one thing I do think is like I feel like I get in my own head. And so sometimes hearing from somebody else helps you come up with something even better, you know, because someone can say, well, did you try this? And what about that? And and, and actually, Kurt and I sat here in, in my, I kind of have a little home studio, not real. I mean, you don't need much for a studio as a singer. You pretty much just need a computer and a microphone, you know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we just sat here over the weekend and listened to three new songs we've been working on. And we sat and I, I'm, when I recorded, I'm just scatting, you know, that, 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 you know, whatever melody, da, 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 you know, I'm not actually singing any lyrics, but just kind of getting a, a melody base. And uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's, I guess that's where the melodies come from. And I, I'm glad you like it. Thank you very much. Um, the album is titled Off the Rails, right? And it's named after one of the songs. Yes. Uh, a deeper meaning to this title. Uh, you know, it really, for me, I just feel like, you know, the last few years, you know, since the pandemic and stuff, a lot of, a lot of just, I don't know, crazy, weird stuff has happened. Uh, where it just feels like things are really turned upside down. And so I don't, that, that's what the motivation for the song, for the song. And then when we were looking for a title for the album, that just seemed like the, the best title, you know, for, uh, for the album itself. And uh, generally, what subjects are you mostly touching upon on this record? Um, I kind of varies. I mean, you know, this is, this is what I would call classic rock inspired music. And so I think um, you certainly have some relationship oriented stuff in there. Um, you know, for me, you know, my, my brother passed away in 2020, shortly before I made Sonic Healing, and I dedicated that album to him, and I had a song on there that was inspired by him, and, and I, I was writing these songs probably in 2000, yeah, the fall of 2022, uh, still thinking a lot about my brother, so actually like three of the songs on the album were, um, you know, still kind of inspired by my brother, dealing with that loss and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think there's some of that, you know, but like there's a song called Are You With Me? And it's inspired by my brother. I don't know if I would say it's a directly link, but really what the song is is about for me is um, that feeling of, you know, you lose someone, but then feeling like somehow they're still present. Like you're kind of, you know, like you feel like, did I just see them or are they around the corner? Are they still with me? And that's, you know, I, that's what that song's about. So, uh, so yeah, so I mean, I don't know, there's that, there's rock and roll, whatever, you know, this is classic rock, so it's kind of relationships, rock and roll, and then, you know, I don't know, any, anything else, you know. I actually have a number of questions about some of the songs, but before we get to this, uh, I wanted to ask you, how does your approach uh, differs on Off the Rails from what you do in Riot? Well, I think, generally speaking, where it, where it gets different is just mostly the music, you know, I mean, I start with a different platform of music and so that inspires, you know, different, you know, different kind of creative thinking. Also with Riot, you know, I, I'm making melodies, but um, I'm working with Donnie, I'm working with Mike, you know, a lot of times Mike has strong melody ideas and so he'll play his guitar, you know, beep, 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 you know, and he'll, he'll kind of play out a melody. And so then at that point, I'm, kind of mostly just writing lyrics to go along with melodies but sometimes i'll alter them and say look this is more the way a singer would do it or this is more singable or whatever i think this might be more so you know we interact with each other that way donnie you know he does both sometimes he hands me he'll, he'll sing it and then what i'll do is uh i'll sing it but then i have to transfer because he doesn't sing it where i would sing it vocally speaking because he can't sing that high um, and so I'll have to try to transfer the melody and translate it and maybe alter it, make it more singable and throw in my two cents. But then sometimes he'll just hand me music and I'll just come up with, you know, all the melodies. Um, but I think, you know, they write, you know, the, the songs we the write are quite different from what I'm writing with this classic rock stuff. So I think that's the main reason it kind of sounds different. But vocally speaking with me, I have a very clean voice, right? You know, um, I, I can't really sing. Like if you listen to some of my stuff with Reverence, I guess, you know, I did two albums with Reverence 
there I tried to sound a little more, you know, raspy. Um, the only way I know how to do that is by overamping my voice a little bit. It's actually not even something I would I would do live just because it's just it's harder on my voice. You know, I can get away with the recordings. I just do a little bit and stop. Um, but yeah, I have, a, I have like a hopelessly clean voice, really. Like a lot of people consider that my great my great strength, but it's kind of like people that have curly hair. They maybe like short hair. People that have short hair, they maybe like curly. You know, I, or, or, excuse me, straight hair. You know, so it's like I, I I have what I have. You know, I I can't sing the raspy stuff. You know, I I listen to, to tones like Ronnie James Dio or whatever where they have that raspy tone, and you know, you just not, you're not going to get that out of me because that's just not. I, I don't really sound like that. Oh, stick to what you do because what you do is is the best of the best. Well, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and, and in fact, how did you find time to and complete two mm -hmm. demanding records? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, the 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 riot one was, you know, it's kind of a, was a long time in coming. Um, we had been working on quite a few of the songs before the pandemic ever even started. Um, so, and then when the pandemic came, that just slowed us down. Um, but actually, I did run into a bit of a. So the riot album did delay um my solo album because like i had to get the all the riot you know because what happens we work on demos but then you come back and say okay everything's all set now now go record final vocals and so that did uh that did kind of get in my way i had to um i had to finish up all the riot vocals before i could then go in and finish this one and, and so that's you know you know so they're definitely it was it was tough but fortunately like a lot of the creative work you know behind writing the songs and writing the lyrics had happened prior because vocally wise i'm pretty sure let me think yeah I, I i recorded the vocals for both of those albums i believe in 23 um but most of the writing like i know all the writing for this one pretty much all happened uh in 22 so you know so yeah it's, it's, it's just been longer you know the riot album was you know what we had a big gap between albums so we had plenty of time but you know, it's, it's definitely, it can be, it could be a lot. Part of what delays it too is when you start playing live shows, you know, when we start playing live shows, right now you're, your free time's doing that and less time there. And obviously I have a, I have a, a real job like you, or I, I, I run a manufacturing company. So I, I, I'm normally working too. So between yeah. that and kids and the whole nine yards, it's hard to get it all done. You know, of course. Um, your current single doctor, what is that song about? Actually, that one has a kind of a story because originally the song was called Open Road. And, but I just, I don't know, I wasn't feeling that excited by the melodies. I thought, man, because I love the intro riff and I thought, man, I, I just feel like this could get better. And I felt like I was, and so I reached out to Frank Gilchrist, the, uh, the drummer from Riot. And I said, Frank, man, I said, if I send you something, can you maybe just throw some melody suggestions at me? What do you think? You know, I, I need to bounce this off somebody and come up with something and, and I didn't tell him to change the topic, but when I did, you know, I, I, Frank's like me, a lot of times when you're making up melodies, some words kind of come in because, you know, you, when you're developing a chorus hook, sometimes the words are part of what, how you get the hook. And he came back to me with this, uh, this, this concept, this call me the doctor, uh, which we just shortened the title to the doctor. Uh, but he came up with that chorus hook, you know, the call me the doctor. He came up with that and, a lot of the melodies for the verses and he and I worked together and tweaked it and he came up with a lot of the lyrics too. So I, you know, I really just kind of helped him tweak the lyrics and cater it. So we kind of have a co-write on it, but yeah. So um, yeah. What's it about? Well, I mean, I guess to, in my mind, I mean, what it's kind of about is basically, uh, you know, the promise of, you know, essentially a drug dealer, like he's going to make your life so awesome, but it's like that false promise that you don't want to fall for. Uh, that being said, though, there's a there's a fair amount of what I would call innuendo in the song, too, whereas the doctor could be like a, a doctor of love, too, if you really wanted. But uh, so we kind of played off that a little bit. But in my mind, it's really more about the false promise of, a you know, oh, you're going to have so much fun if you, you know, do this stuff. I'll take care of you, you know, that sort of thing. That makes sense. Uh, my early favorite happens to be Start With Love. Really? It uh, has a very positive feel. Care to explain it? You know, what's funny is I read a review online and the guy was quite, he was very complimentary of the album, but he said where it kind of goes off the rails a little bit and he threw my title at me is when he does ballads and he listed part of me, uh, start with love. Um, and I can't remember the, the third one. And what's weird for me is I don't, I've always really loved start with love. Cause I just, 
when it when it first kicks in that that riff that you know that that riff it's just got such a driving kind of groovy positive feel to it you know um so i've always really liked the music so i appreciate that i had someone else tell me that was their favorite too um and really musically and topically it's kind of it you know it, it was really inspired by my wife and, and our relationship but really it's it's you know everybody if you're in a relationship you have some rocky times it just happens and and really that it's just reminding you that if you just keep your mind on the right thing and, and you start with love that you know you're your chances of success are much higher. So, so it really is. It's kind of meant to be an uplifting uh, song in that regard. It definitely is. Another one of my favorites, early favorites, because those could change. I mean, the album, I only had it for a few days. So, so oh, yeah. you know, there's still a lot of listening ahead of me. But another one of my favorites happens to be Can't Get Enough. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that nice. Was yeah, that was kind of different on the album. You know, they, it kind of st stuck out. And I don't know what you'd call it, if it's kind of a, I don't know if you call it a bluesy kind of feel or whatever. I don't know what you'd call it. And, uh, you know, that one, that one, believe it or not, it was kind of, it, it's kind of inspired by my wife too. Sometimes I write songs for my wife and then she gets mad at me because she doesn't understand I'm being like a little tongue in cheek. I'm like, I'm like, you know, you know, like, Hey, it's, it says in there that I love you. It says that you're a little bit of a pain in the neck, but I love you or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, so, uh, so yeah, I don't, my wife is my muse, I guess, you know, we've been together for 25 years now. And, uh, so I've written a lot of songs inspired by her and our, our relationship. So really that's what that song's all about. It's just kind of a basic rocker and it's kind of meant to be a little tongue in cheek, you know, you know, like, uh, you know, basic, the basic concept is you kind of drive me nuts, but I can't get enough of you. Like I'm still madly in love with you, you know, even though, even though we drive each other crazy, you know, that sort of thing. My newest favorite, newest ah. favorite, Name the Time and Place. Oh, funny. Amazing song, and it appears to carry a very personal message. Tell yeah, me. yeah. Well, what's funny, I think that was the third one that the guy had named as a ballad. and he, So he wasn't real happy that I put some ballads on there. And I don't know. I, to me, I feel like they're pretty rocking for a ballad, but whatever, I guess. Um, you know, I've never known, does a ballad mean the music's wimpy, or does that mean it's just a, a love topic? You know, I, I don't know. Um, that one, it probably could be easily mistaken for another love song, and it, it, in a way it is, but it's it, that song was inspired by my best friend that I've known since second grade, and we had all these shared experiences. I wasn't sure if anybody liked it because um, the lyrics are very particular to, to uh, you know, they're all references to things that we did as little kids or later on in our life, and, uh, but the basic message is that, you know, you know, we, you know, we, 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 you know, spent all this time together and we were young and we cared about each other and, and we had this connection. And even though now he lives, you know, in, in Las Vegas and I barely ever see him, you know, uh, not even, you know, not even once a year, you know, there's just this strong, strong connection where I feel like I will be there for you. And I know you'll be there for me if we need each other, you know, and, and that's really what that song. So it's like, Hey, just name the time and place and, and I'll be there for you. Um, so that's really what that song's all about. And that is perhaps why I'm relating to this song, because I have a similar situation with having a, a really good friend on the other side of the ocean back in Poland, which oh, is wow. originally where I'm from. So yes. it, it totally makes sense. Thank you. Um, OK, I named some of my favorites. What are your favorites? Um, you know, I, I think the ones you named are good ones for me. I definitely right now I'm really been grooving on Start With Love. Um, I was a little surprised because, you know, you, you look at your Spotify or whatever, and that one had a little spike in in uh, listens. Not that I get that many listens. I don't have that many followers, but um, that one kind of shot up. Someone put it on a playlist. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I I guess I, I really I, I really enjoy them all. I, I really like sitting on top of the world. That was one of those ones I was debating. Do I make that one of the videos? Um, uh, I, I definitely, obviously, I like the two videos because I feel like when you do a video, I, I was wanting to do something that kind of pulled me in, you know, like, um, and, and, you know, a rocker that kind of pulls you in. So that's why, you know, the doctor and, and, um, and, uh, and the first one, the name I can't remember, uh, oh, off the rails, sorry. Um, you know, that's why they got chosen. And I think what it was is like, I was trying to decide video wise between off the rails and sitting on top of the world. And when I talked to the videographer, uh, Jamie, uh, Jamie Brown, he was, he, he, he liked the dynamics at the beginning of uh, Off the Rails, and he just felt like he could come up with better video concepts for it. So, um, so I definitely like those. Um, I do have another video going to come out for uh, Are You With Me? 
Um, I do like that song too. I think it's got some cool energy, but it's like, you know, and I showed that to Jamie too. I didn't think it could be a lead video just because it's kind of what I would call a slow burn type of song where it kind of just starts out a little slower and builds and builds and builds in energy. Um, uh, the, 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 the song Gone, I think is, is kind of more of an emotionally, uh, well, maybe that was the third song that the guy said was a ballad. I think that one's more of an emotional, um, obviously that's about, you know, missing someone who's passed away. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I don't know. I really like that one too. So I, it's, it's tough for me. People ask me that a lot, like, what are your favorites? But it's just so difficult because, you know, if I, if I wasn't liking one, like I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't put it on the album, you know, um, there was, a, there was actually a, 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 a 13th song that we recorded. And I just, I left that one on the chopping floor. Cause I just was like, ah, it's not quite strong enough, you know, um, yet another one inspired by my wife, but I just didn't think it was good enough, you know? Um, and then sometimes I don't know, like there was, um, lone wolf was one that I was like, I don't know. I don't know about this one. Is that, is that good? Should I, you know, and we had to decide because when you do the vinyl, you can only get like, what 22 minutes of music per side and so we had to chop it down to like 10 songs for the vinyl and that's why the other two are called bonus tracks but then i the one guy who was reviewing it said it was a crime that lone wolf was a bonus track because it was like one of his favorite songs so you know so i don't know it's so hard you know what i mean everybody's got a different thought as to which ones are their favorite well, you, you can't please everyone i mean that's kind of what it comes down to um in general this album has a, a very um positive almost spiritual vibe was that a conscious move on your part or simply things just kind of worked out that way i would say very conscious i mean if you look at my last album it was sonic healing and it was all about you know to me well what that song was about is this notion that music you know is kind of you know can basically heal you it just really brings a lot of joy into your life and i don't know at this at this stage in my life i just i don't know i i guess there it's not like I never have a negative thought, you know, and I suppose on this album, you could look at something like roll me over and say, Oh, that one has a pinch of a negative twinge to it. Um, but in general, you know, I, I just, you know, I want to, especially with classic rock, you know, when I think back to classic rock, it wasn't a lot of complaining and whining. It was just a lot of partying and having fun and enjoying life and love and, and friendships and stuff. And so I, I think that's really where I'm at, you know, especially with the, especially with, you know, the solo type stuff. Mm -hmm. um how do, does this album differ from from your first uh record sonic healing i i think when we did the first one um there were you know when we first did sonic healing i think kurt was kind of getting in a groove and part of the way he'd get in a groove is by saying well you know how would foreigner write a song or how would triumph or you know somebody like write a song and so you know i think there were a couple especially like if you look at the first album, Sonic Healing, you look at the song All on the Line. I mean, you play the beginning of it, it kind of reminds you of Hot Blooded. I mean, the song doesn't sound anything like Hot Blooded, but it's just the way it's got that, dun, 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 you know, bass at the beginning. Um, and and I think there was another song uh, called Running After You where, I mean, only a moment, but it, there was a there's like a bridge section, you know, where I'm like riding on an endless wave, our minds on overdrive. And it's like, I hear that and I just think it sounds just like rush for some reason you know and so so i i feel like on the first album you had these moments where you could feel like oh that you know that might be this whereas on this album i don't know why i, di I didn't get any of that really i don't really have moments on except for one song lone wolf kind of reminds me of i don't know why i have a cult song the music i couldn't make my voice so the whole time i was trying to write for it i was hearing ian at that's Barry's voice and and i can't sing like he does you know you're all rubber you know i don't know i can't make my voice sound like his but i kept wanting my voice to sound like his you know um but yeah so so i think that to me is kind of the difference but i mean other than that i mean i the other difference i would say is i think the last one was just a little more just straight up rock whereas this one's got like i said a few that are slower burns or kind of more moody emotional songs um although you know like on the chorus and stuff they still get pretty heavy um, but I, I think that's probably the differences for me between the two. Other than that, they're pretty sonically close. I think they're, you know, you can tell they're, it's the same, you know, same crew doing it, you know. Um, what kind of a feedback are you getting uh, on the new album so far? So far, I've had, you know, really good positive feedback from people, um, you know, got back my first back, first week sales and looked pretty good. I mean, nobody really sells much of anything, but, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of nice because, I mean, 
I mean, I'm just Todd Paul. I'm, I'm not really that known everywhere, you know, so it's kind of kind of nice just to feel like I get, uh, you know, get some attention and get something. I mean, my whole thing with this, I, I mean, I know it's not going to be like all of a sudden I can quit my job. I mean, to me, it's more at this stage in my life. I just want to, you know, I just love to create and, and I love people to hear my music and I just want to do something that brings joy into people's lives. And so if I can get some of that feedback and I've had a lot of that from people just tell me they like it and stuff. I haven't really combed around for a lot of reviews yet. So I don't know if there's very many reviews on the internet because I haven't really looked. Um, so I've only read, I think I stumbled across just one, one or two so far because people emailed them or shared me or tagged me in them or something. Mm -hmm. so. uh, you just played a, a live show, like a record release party. How did things go? Yeah, you know, it, we put out the first album and, and we talked, you know, God, it'd be so nice to play some shows, but Kurt lives in California. I live in Michigan. Um, and so, you know, I was just like, man, I really want to do something. So for this one, and, and what's hard too is me finding a band, you know, to kind of do it. Cause it's like, Hey, you guys want to learn a bunch of my songs and then not really get paid much, you know, <laughs> stuff like that, you know? Um, but I, there was, there's a local band, a, a guy, um, Todd Walraven, who I, I played with a band called Harlot way back in the nineties. Um, so I've known him for 30 years or more, a little over 30 years. And he, he's in a local band here. Um, and they're just a bunch of really great musicians, you know, and they, I had an opportunity to play a show um, in May and I wanted to be able to do some of my originals. And then they, they said, well, we can learn six of your songs and learn, you know, we'll do some cover tunes too. And so it's kind of, I scratched their back. They scratched mine because they played that show with me, but then I did some other shows with them where I stepped in and did some guest vocals for them and stuff. And w when we played out that show in May, um, that I was asked to do it went it went well and and so that's when I started saying hmm, maybe I could have a, an album release show or something um, and I talked to them and they were like yeah I mean well we've already learned six songs off Sonic Healing let's learn six songs off off uh, you know off the rails and we'll go from there and I and I had asked Kurt you know would you be willing to fly in so I flew Kurt in and what's crazy is you know I I did rehearse with them twice like once in August and once just a couple weeks ago and then we flew Kurt in and we got together on a Thursday night at the club and we went through each song once that we were going to play. There was 15 songs we we're going to play, 12 of mine and three cover tunes. We went through each song once um, and then we played them all the next night. Now, I'm not going to say we were perfect, like there wasn't any mistakes, but for the most part, not too many things that people would notice. You know, as musicians, you know every little thing. But uh, but yeah, it went surprisingly well. We had it had a good crowd there was butts in every seat and and uh you know it wasn't sold out or anything like that like 500 people but it was about 200 people and just you know really fun to get together and play a show and it's kind of frustrating to put on an album and never feel like you get to play live with them at all you know so sure uh, so um, felt really good. that's why i want to ask you any chance of any additional shows in, in time to come I, I would love to i mean just realistically i don't think there's a whole lot of demand for you know for me to go out and play shows so you know, I, I might, you know, I, I might like the guys, you know, in the band were into it. And Kurt sound like he was into it. So what I might try to do is look around and see if there's a band that would be somewhat appropriate that that's playing a few shows. And maybe we could just step in and be like an opening band with them for like a long weekend or something like that. And, you know, just kind of go out and uh, you know try to have some fun with it. But, you know, it's, it's hard because now you got to you got to find the time and make the effort to do that. And there's always so much going on, you know. I know yet this year I'm still pretty busy. I got some shows coming up with Riot, and then I have a, a Christmas show here locally and stuff like that. So, uh, so it's, you know, it's just hard to find the time. And I, and the reality is a lot of times people think of the music industry and they think, oh, well, if you're friends with this band, then you can do this and you could do that. But it's not really a friendship thing so much. I mean, you know, everybody's trying to make money and, you know, the headliners struggling to make money. So they only want an opener that can put butts in seats and, or you got to pay them to get on, you know, so I mean, it's just, you know, it's not like I could just call up, Oh, my buddies in X band and they'll bring me out on tour with them because that just, I mean, maybe it happens, but not really. You know what I mean? Even though you're very friends, complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody it's, it's a business, you know, and, and everybody's struggling to make money, you know, cause there's, there's no, there's very little money in producing music. So that puts all the pressure on, on the live shows now. And so now it's like you, you know, it used to be you'd play live shows so that you could sell more albums. And nowadays, it's like you put out albums so you can play more live shows, really. Yeah, um, that's, yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask you some historic questions about your career. 
Um, how did you first get into singing and becoming a musician? Well, I mean, I've, I've really been a singer, I mean, forever, really. I mean, I've liked to sing and wanted to sing. I, mean, I remember when I was like five, I was in kindergarten and my kindergarten teacher, uh, Mrs. Becker, told my mom that, you know, he's got a good voice and like he, he stays in key, you know, and when he's singing and everything. So maybe you should get him some piano lessons or something. And so I ended up you know, my mom and, and my mom always loved music and loved piano. Not, I wouldn't call her musical because she didn't play any instruments, but she always loved music. And so she got me playing piano when I was like nine years old. And so I did that. And I was kind of into some of the piano player people back then, Barry Manilow and Lionel Richie and all that kind of stuff. And, and then as I was becoming a teenager, I had two older brothers. And obviously I was becoming a teenager in the early 80s. Um, you know, in 1982, I turned 13, and that's really right when all this kind of great rock was coming out. I mean, before that, my brother was into Ted Nugent. My other brother was into Styx and Ario Speedwagon, and uh, you know, my brother John was into Joe Walsh and all sorts. You know, you know, so so it's like there was that late 70s, early 80s rock stuff, and obviously you hear it all over the radio. And then we had that explosion of all the metal from Ronnie James Dio and Iron Maiden and Queensryche and you know you name it everybody so the 80s was just an incredible time for music and I was I was really in the thick of it by then I mean by the time I was 15 uh, my brother John who had band you know he's four years older than me but he had a, he had a band and um, he was needing a singer so he actually got me to sing in the band when I was 15 years old so actually this this January and February will be 40 years um, since I played out for the first time, you know, live with a band. That's amazing. Um, yeah, isn't it, isn't it ridiculous, you know? <laughs> it's hard to believe it's been that long. Um, and so, yeah, so I mean, and, and, and I think, you know, for me, um, and then later on, like in 1996, when I was kind of done working with my brother and, and pretty much done with kind of, I would say, hard rock and heavy metal, that's when I started taking acoustic guitar lessons, you know, guitar lessons. I picked up acoustic guitar and kind of learned music theory that I was too lazy to learn when I was a piano player as a little kid. Um, and so, um, and then got exposed to lots of other music too, you know, uh, other artists, not just hard rock and heavy metal and stuff. And, and uh, but I don't know, I just have a real passion for, for rock, hard rock and, and heavy metal, uh, you know, power metal, whatever, the, the singing variety of metal. I, I can't even do this guttural stuff that people do. I, I don't even know how they do it. It blows my mind. It just sounds to me like they're destroying their throats, but, but I guess they know what they're doing. So. Oh, yes, they do. Yeah, uh, even the ladies do it now. It's amazing. Yeah. And they're very effective. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you, you mentioned the, the name Harlot before, right? Mm -hmm. That was one of your first bands. Uh, what do you remember from that time? Well, you know, when when we first started, you know, my brother, John, you know, he had a band and, and he would kind of oscillate one minute. We're playing cover tunes. The next minute he wants to do originals and then he's back to cover, you know, and because and there was always that struggle. You know, we're from a small area. And when you play originals, there wasn't very many opportunities to play out. So cover tunes, you could at least get a chance to get in the bars. But I remember what happened is when I sang for my brother. So when I was a little boy, pre puberty, I had a really high voice. Right. Because I was a little boy. Well, then when I went through puberty about the age, I was a late bloomer. So about the age of 15, my voice kind of changed. So when I sang in, in the band with him for the first time, I mean, I had, I guess, kind of a tenorish voice, but I didn't have any of that real high stuff, you know? Um, and so, um, so I, I did that band thing for, I don't know, it was only a few months and then I was out. And then, but when I got out, um, I, like I went to see uh, Jeff Tate from Queensryche. They performed, um, uh, December 11th will be like actually 40 years. Uh, they, they performed in, it was on the Warning album. They opened up for Kiss. Um, they performed in my hometown, Saginaw, on December 11th, 1984. I looked up the date just because I was curious. And, um, and so it's been 40 years. And when I saw him perform, I was just absolutely blown away. Like, oh my God, how does he hit these notes? How, you know, he sounds so awesome. How does he do that? And so like, so that was when I was, um, uh, you know, I had, I, well, I 14 when their, when their album came out, I was just 14. And then when I saw him live, I was 15, I turned 15 by then. And, um, and I remember thinking, man, I, I it's like, I was on a quest. Like I got to learn how to sing higher like that. And I remember asking local singers and all sorts of people and, and it was him and it was Eric Adams from Manowar and then like tons of other, those are my two top ones. And then tons of other, uh, other singers, obviously from the day, you know, 
And I would drive around, you know, and I, I would sing along to jam boxes. But when I turned 16, I would drive around my car listening to stuff. And I was trying, trying. So finally, I think I was uh, late 16 years old, whatever. I, I the, the first note, the first head voice note I learned how to sing or I, that, that I, I was able to successfully do was the note at the beginning of Take Hold of the Flame, you know, that. So take you, you know, that note. And uh, that was more of a falsetto version, not the powerful version, but I don't want to blow your ears off here. Um, but uh, that I, I remember, I like I learned that and I ran home to my brothers. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know, I can do this. I can do this. Listen, listen. And and we ran up to because I shared a, a bedroom with my my one brother. Um, and I, I, we all go upstairs and he puts that sign on the stair. I'm like, listen, listen. And I'm like, we see the light. And, you know, I'm singing the whole thing for him. And then I hit that note and I'm like, like that and they're both just like yeah you know whatever but then a few months later my brother's like hey we got this original thing going you know we're, we're, we're harlot we're going original music you know do you want to get in the band and uh, i'm like yeah sure so we started started writing music together and uh you know i was still in high school we we wrote uh we wrote like a, a demo we ended up releasing a demo uh it was called virgin wings and on cassette like literally we made the cassettes ourselves you know bought stickers to put on the cassettes and bought jackets and the you know and recorded them ourselves the whole nine yards you know um so we did that and then we tried to step it up a notch we ended up writing we, we used to play a lot of nightclubs too down in detroit we played all the popular clubs in detroit like blondies and harpos and limelight and uh the ritz and you name it we would drive down to detroit to play these shows even flint we played like contos and flint and uh, you know, we played up in this area too, if we could. And um, so we, we were trying and I, we really just thought, oh man, we're going to, we're going to make it. And I was singing high and screaming my head off and had hair down to my waist and whatever have you. And, um, and, you know, we ended up, so we, we wrote a, wrote enough for a whole album and then I'm going to, we said, we're going to, a, you know, like a real studio. And, you know, we went to a studio down in Fenton called Alliance, Alliance Recording Studio. It's where like Grand Funk Railroad had recorded and, uh, there was a Al Hirsch was Al Hirsch Hirschenberg or something like it was his name, but he had produced Ted Nugent albums and stuff like that. And he didn't produce ours, but you know, he was affiliated with the studio. It was his studio and all that. Um, so yeah, I mean, we were all excited. I remember I, I'd gone, I'd started college and um, I I'd saved up my paper out money and my money working for my family business. I had bought a car. And then when I went away to college, I sold the car. Um, and, and I used the money from selling that to help pay to get the CD made and printed and whatnot. Have you. And so, yeah, we were just all in and independent. And that, so that came out in 1988, that was called 25 gets a ride. So that's kind of, wow. that's the one that, that that's the one where it was interesting because I found a distributor later in the nineties and the distributor got some copies of that from me and he sent them off to Europe and Japan. And that's why people even know about, cause it was independently produced. It was never released on a, a major record label back in the day, you know, on a record label back in the day. Um, there are countless bands like that that are actually making a comeback now. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, eventually, you join up with Jack Starr, right? Yeah. And you make some records with him. What do you recall from that experience? Yeah, basically, you know, the, the, the Harlot thing led to another album that's pulling teeth. And then by 96, I was done. And then, and then I wasn't doing anything. I was learning guitar and stuff, but I wasn't doing any singing. But then around the early aughts, you know, 2000, 2001, stuff like that, I was, I was kind of getting that desire to do it again. Um, and uh, my brother, my brother, Rick, he saw an ad from Burning Star, well, from, uh, from Jack or from actually Magic Circle Music saying that Jack Starr was going to put out an album and that he was looking for a singer. And I had known Jack because I bought uh, my brother, my one brother, Rick, kind of had a record store and I bought Jack's Out of the Darkness cassette way back in 1984. Um, so I knew Jack. I didn't know his Burning Star stuff, though. I mean, I knew that it was there, but I hadn't listened to it. Um, and uh, but but hearing that the album, that, that the record label was owned by members of Manowar, you know, Joey DeMeo, uh, I was just like, wow, well, because I was a big fan of Manowar. And I thought, well, and my, I remember my brother Rick saying, well, if anybody can appreciate your singing, it would be these guys. And, and so I sent it in. And actually, interestingly enough, Joey is the one that picked me to, to be in the band. Um, so like, there was a guy, Manuel, uh, that worked for, jo that I think he still works for Joey, that, that kind of heard my demo CD because I just sent some stuff that I'd recorded into them on a CD. He heard it and he told Joey, I think you want to listen to this guy. And Joey liked it. And I think that, 
uh, Ned and, and Jack had already kind of set their sights on another fellow. Um, but but Joey uh, overruled them, I guess, and said, no, nope, no, nope, this is going to be the guy. So that's how I ended up getting in the band. And obviously, you know, Jack appreciated me later. But I, I, at first, uh, it was really Joey's decision. So that's kind of how I got in the band. And then I recorded the I, rec I, I'm, I, I I'm trying to think. It was a long time before I met Jack. Like it was a few years. So like they were down in Florida, Jack and Ned, and I would talk to Ned on the phone and Jack a little bit. But as far as meeting them in person, I, I think I recorded maybe a lot of the first album before I ever even met him in person because we went down there and played a show or something. Um, so so yeah, that uh, so I worked with him on three albums. But you know, since we don't live close to each other, I don't have necessarily a lot of shared experiences. Although we did play some live shows a few times and had a lot of fun with them. I, I like the guys. I still do. I thought we put out some great albums. And um, it reached a point for me where I just, I once I got in Riot, I ran out of time. You know, I actually had Burning Star, Reverence, and Riot all going at the same time. And I just reached a point where I didn't have time to play a live with all of them. And that's when I said, and I just told them, you know, like, look, maybe you want to get another singer because that way you'd be able to play live, you know, with that singer. And, you know, um, but I told them that before Strong, uh, is it Stronger Than Steel? Is that the name of the album? I can't remember the third album I did with him. I think it's called Stronger Than Steel. But, or there's a song called Stronger Steel on the album. But in any event, I told him before that one, I said, hey, maybe you want to get another singer because I don't think I'll be able to perform live with you. And they said, no, no, we want you to do it. So I, I did do it. Mm -hmm. uh, for him. And almost like simultaneously, you did Reverence, which you also mentioned before. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Because so I, I did the first... I can't, I think, I think I did the first two albums with Burning Star. And then that's when uh, Brian Holland reached out to me and said, Hey, and, 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 you know, and the reason was, is, um, and I'm not, it's no knock on Jack and Ned, but like they're down working on music together. So a lot of times when it come to me, pretty much melodies were created and, and, and stuff. And, like I would get co-writes on the songs, but mostly just because I'd finished up some lyrics and stuff. So I didn't really have, I, I kind of wanted to have something where I had more uh, freedom to do what I wanted to do. Not like I thought I'd be so much better, but you know, what What the heck. And then, and then, and then the Burning Star stuff was a little few and far between, you know, it wasn't like I was busy on it all the time. Um, so when Brian came to me and said, Hey, you want to work on something together? I'm like, yeah, let's start. Let's just start. And, and you know, we put together some great songs. I, I'm really proud of those two reverence albums I did. I, I I think I don't know. I mean, I thought the music was cool and really hooky and great, but I mean, I wrote it, so I'm biased, right? You know, um, I hoped it would catch on, but it's just it's really hard to make a dent in the music business, you know. So, so how did you end up in in Riot of of all bands? Well, what happened is Land of the Dead, the second album I did with Burning Star, that was produced by a Polish fellow, Bart Gabriel. So I don't know if you know Bart Gabriel. I'm aware of him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so what happened is. I don't know, he was friendly with Jack or whatever and Ned, but he 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 was going to produce the album for us. And then he arranged some shows for us to go play live. And then his we needed a second guitar player. And so his wife, Marta, Marta Gabriel, actually played guitar for us. So we played the Keep It True Festival. Then we played in Italy, in Brescia, Italy. And then we played a couple shows in Greece. So we did four shows. And that's where I met Bart in person. And I know it was a couple months or so after that, that was in 2013. And I think it was a couple, two, three months after that, that Bart reached out to me and said, Hey, you know, I'm friends with the guys in Riot, or at least Donnie from Riot. And uh, they're, they're looking for a singer. And I was like, really? Because I, I, I had heard that Mark Reale passed away. And I just figured, you know, the band was done. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and at that point, I hadn't really followed him. So like, I, I wasn't even aware of Immortal Soul, really. Um, and, and really, I hadn't. Honestly, my, my knowledge of Riot pretty much stopped after uh, Privilege of Power. I just, you know, we got into the 90s. I was listening to other music. And so all the Mike DeMeo era and stuff, that just totally escaped me. And I, I never never heard it, even though I was very familiar with the earlier Riot stuff. Um, but yeah, I, Bart was like, hey, you know, and I told him, I said, oh, man, what, what, what do you think? And, and, you know, should I, should I try it? And he's like, well, God, you know, Riot's a legend. For sure you'd want to be in Riot, you know? So I'm like, oh, all right. And then I remember talking to Donnie and, you know, doing one of the first things I did is I, I asked him, I said, well, can you give me a set list? Like what, what, what would be the songs you sing? And so I put together a set list and put them on my iPod or something. And then I went down like in my basement and music room or whatever have you and kind of like sat and I don't say scream my head off, but I kind of scream my head off to a, to a stereo to see like, could I even sing these songs? You know, 
because I remember when I was younger listening to Thundersteel and thinking, oh my God, you know, like listen to that guy. He sounds like he's on helium, you know. Um, uh, but it turns out I can sing that too. So I guess I'm, you know, I don't sound exactly like Tony Moore, but I can hit the notes at least, you know. Um, and so that was one of the first things. And then I recorded a couple a couple songs for actually the first thing I did to try out is I recorded three songs off of Immortal Soul. So they gave me just the music and I put vocals on them. Um, and they thought they sounded great. So I worked on a couple demos and then Donnie wasn't communicating with me a lot. So I didn't know what was going on. He, uh, I recorded the two demos and he's, he just kind of disappeared for a while. And then he came back a month or so later and said, Hey man, I showed the demo to the record label and, and they thought they're great. They want us to keep working. They're interested. And I was like, what the record label? Oh, does that mean I'm in the band? You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so so i i actually started working on songs i mean i i wrote i wrote a couple like i wrote bring the hammer down and stuff like that a few songs before they ever even announced me being in the band because that was not until like november of 2013 that they announced me in the band so. wow um out of all of those bands and releases that we spoke about today uh which one do you think best represents you as a singer oh wow um, I mean, I think that the one thing I would say about Riot is, you know, obviously I've, that's given me my most notoriety in terms of going around playing shows. Um, the one thing I love about Riot too, is I, I feel like it's a very natural form of singing for me. I'm, I'm very blessed because Guy Speranza and, and, uh, and Tony Moore, which I really, you know, I love Rhett Forrester and, and, and Mike DeMeo is awesome too. But I mean, those are the two singers that, that we need to do the most. And for me, actually, Tony Moore, that we do more of that. And because, because it feels so natural for me to sing that stuff, and then because the guys in Riot like my natural voice, you know, they just like what I, the way I naturally sound. They like a clean singer. I would say I feel really at home with them. Also, the guys in the band are just just stupidly incredible musicians. And so it feels to me like there's a magic when I play live with them for sure. Um, now, that being said, I would say that the albums that I've done with Kurt, they're very natural. Like the style of music is really up my alley too. So it's so it's kind of a toss up maybe between, between those two. And that doesn't mean I'm not proud of the other ones too, but I, I think as far as the most natural fit, you know, probably somewhere between Riot and then the solo stuff I do. You're also involved in operating your own business. You're doing music. How do you make it all agree and work? Uh, well, you know, it helps to have a supportive family for sure. Um, you know, I have a wife and three kids. Uh, fortunately, my, my two oldest are actually off in college now. But um, but the uh, I, I think it really comes down. So work, my work life, we have a family business. We have about 215 employees. So I've been there. I've been working full time there since 1991. Um, I actually started working there, though, in 1984. I was only 14 years old. So I've, I've been working there for a really long time. Um, and so obviously, I've worked my way up. I'm the president of the company now. Uh, fortunately, I'm in a position where I'm not, I'm not doing the day-to-day -day work. I'm working more on projects and strategic things. So um, you know, if I have to push off a project or something to go do some shows, it's not really the end of the world. Um, and then obviously, when, when you travel around, you can get messages and stuff by a phone and and but I but we run well I run the company with open book management um, and open book management is basically a, it's it's something where I mean some people call it profit sharing right like they'll think of profit sharing ours goes way beyond that like we base, we we share the financials with the employees like an operating statement we teach I I personally teach the employees you know about financial literacy the things we do that make money that help us make money at the end of every month. We look and see if we've made money, if there is a payout and all this kind of stuff. And it's paid the same from the reception. It's all up to me. So, and, and we can have some pretty reasonably substantial bonuses. And so, and the reason I do that is I care about my employees and I, I, I love my employees and I know that they're the ones that help us be successful. And so I want to reward them as much as I can. Right. Um, and so, and I think because of that and because of the way we're set up with accountability and lots of other things, I don't want to say the company runs itself because that sounds horrible, but um, but in a way, yeah, I mean, everybody knows what they need to do. So if I'm gone for even six weeks, whatever, they just keep doing, obviously I'll check emails and I'll, I'll check in on things, but I don't have to be there every moment. And so because of that, that's why I'm able to go off and do it. Now, if, if I had a different job where 
you know, I couldn't get the time off work or something, then yeah, it might be really, really difficult. Finally, what is singing to you? What does that mean to you? I, you know, it's, it's so weird. Like I, it's just, it, when something's in your blood like that, like, I mean, people at the office probably laugh at me because, you know, especially if I'm in a good mood, I'll, I walk in the office at eight o'clock in the morning and I'll be singing, walking up the stairs to my office, singing the song that I was just listening to the car, you know I mean? So I, you know, to me, um, I don't, it's just a joyful place. You know I mean? I just love to sing and, and I, I love music, but I love to sing too. So it's not just a matter of loving music. I love to sing along. That's why I tend to listen to, you know, that's why I don't tend to listen to that guttural metal music, not, the music's cool, but I can't sing along with it because I don't sing like that, you know. So I tend to, I tend to listen to stuff that I can sing along with, and uh, and so I don't know. Yeah, it's it's almost like, I don't know. It's almost like a lifeblood, if you will. Makes sense. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. So many great details and so many great insights into the songs and the new album. And good luck with the new album and 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 the riot tours and everything else that that's coming your way. Oh, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you doing the interview. And sorry, I give such long answers. <laughs> it was great. Uh, thanks.